yeah. Asha, if you could you know, lead us in prayer, please, even as we start our session. Yes, Pastor. Dear God, thank you, Lord, for this class, God, as we're about to learn about Galatians, which is the defense, God, that we will be uh, growing in wisdom and knowledge. And I pray that as Pastor, if you guys teach you more, that your spirit will pour out on her as she teaches and that we may grasp everything that she's teaching, God. Thank you for your loving kindness. And also, Lord, for all my classmates and brothers and sisters in the Lord, I pray that they will grow in uh, wisdom and knowledge, and I pray that to equip them and strengthen God. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Oh, yes. Um, so uh, we have finished the epistle to the Galatians. It was a rather hurried job. Uh, but then, you know, in the time available to us, we were able to cover uh, quite a few important points. Uh, so now we are moving into the book of Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesians, um, which Paul has written to them. And uh, so in the light of this, maybe we can begin by looking at the background um, to the book, to the letter. Uh, we could maybe look at the city of Ephesus itself. Uh, the kind of um, setting in which these believers were living. Uh, we will look at the ministry that Paul did in that place. Now, all of this is there in your notes, so you can always uh, you know, go back to it and refer to it. Uh, so um, we, <coughs> we see that uh, this uh, city of Ephesus was one of the important cities in Asia Minor. Uh, now, that's not a term that we are familiar with today, where today when we think of Asia, you know, we think of uh, um, the, uh, you know, the, the current uh, you know, places in Asia. But then when uh, in the Bible, wherever it's talking about Asia, uh, it's basically talking about Asia Minor, uh, which basically was this um, peninsula of Anatolia, um, where you basically have Turkey and you know modern Turkey, modern Turkey and its surrounding regions, uh, all of that would make up. All of it is basically sitting in the peninsula of Anatolia, and that entire area is called Asia Minor. So it's not really Asia; it's a minor Asia. Okay, so in that sense, so um, Ephesus was one of the uh, most important cities in this uh, Anatolian peninsula, and uh, it was considered a great metropolis. Um, now, that's a term that we are very familiar with uh, here in India, especially with all our you know, uh, metro cities which have come up. Uh, so these are basically huge cities which um, are supporting people from um, different cultures, from different nations, and they are huge in size. Uh, so for those times, in for those ancient times, uh, um, Ephesus was a big city. Uh, it had a population of uh, 225,000. So, in our Indian terminology, that would be 2 lakhs, 25, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, 2 lakhs, 25,000. So, uh, that was a rather large number uh, for that time, you know, I mean, uh, because they would not have had the kind of, you know, um, facilities that we have today, uh, you know, so. Um, but of course, today, uh, a metro would have much higher populations. Bangalore itself has got 13 million people living in it. Uh, so, but yeah, in those times, uh, with the with the technology that they had in those times, to be able to support two lakh twenty five thousand would have been quite a great task. And why did this uh, city attract so many people? Um, just like the modern metros are attracting people because of the uh, you know money that they can make over here, uh, because you have um, you know companies here where you can work and then there are a lot of construction sites so laborers can come and earn over here and so uh, people get attracted to these metros because of the um, you know livelihood that they can make in these places so uh, ephesus was a seaport town and uh, so it was this uh, really solid trading center so um, you know you would need people of all classes you would need merchants uh, you would need uh, you know uh, uh, 
workers who will be able to you know maintain accounts the learned people you know who will be able to take care of all the different processes involved in the trade and of course you would have need need the labor force you know we can um, um, make all of this happen so um, it attracted a lot of people and there was also this other spiritual angle to it uh, because uh, this city of ephesus uh, is basically where you had the temple of diana now um, among those ancient seven wonders of the world uh, the temple of diana was one so um, it was a very um, palacious and grand uh, construction uh, because it took 220 years to build it i mean so you can imagine uh, you know how much effort would have gone into it um, the entire building was made of marble it's not just that the even the pathway leading up to the temple was all paved in marble uh, so I mean, I can just imagine the amount of money that it would have been, um, you know, spent in constructing that over 220 years, and the greatness of it is the legend which went along with it that the tem that the statue of Diana sitting over there inside uh, had literally fallen down from heaven, or at least that's what they believed, uh, and uh, so this this temple was considered very important. And so you had an entire business flourishing just around this temple as well. You know, it provided livelihood to a whole lot of people. Uh, so, so this was this huge city. And wherever you have huge city setups, um, you have uh, a lot of grandeur. You have a lot of rich people. You have a lot of um, uh, the latest trends in, you know, in society happening. And at the same time, you would have this really undertrodden, wretched you know, bunch of uh, people uh, who are just managing to hold on. And um, uh, so all the goods, good things and evils which you would find in a modern metro, those are the things that you would have found here in Ephesus. So Paul comes into this kind of a setting and he, uh, you know, uh, does his ministry. Now, of course, during the second missionary journey, he just makes a very brief stop in Ephesus. He doesn't stay there for long. Uh, he just comes and preaches for a bit. Um, and uh, because, you know, he's kind of wanting to go on to Jerusalem. Uh, so uh, he just stays there for a little while. But uh, he brings along Aquila and Priscilla with him and he leaves them over there in Ephesus. Um, so just a minute. Yeah. Uh, so he leaves them in in, in Ephesus uh, over there, and uh, so it's Aquila and Priscilla who kind of you know take the initial steps in um, getting the believers there together and in training up people and you know adding new believers to the church. So they do a lot of groundwork, and uh, so when they come across Apollos, who's you know preaching his heart out uh, with what little knowledge that he has. Uh, you know, they take him under their wings and uh, they train him up. They teach him about the Lord Jesus. So he becomes a believer. And uh, then after they have trained him and discipled him, they send him to Corinth. So uh, even in its initial stages, uh, the Ephesian church had already become a missionary church. They were sending out people to other places, uh, you know, where um, uh, the ministry could spread. And uh, so Apollos is sent off to Corinth. And uh, we, in fact, we learn in Acts chapter 18 that uh, Apollos became a great blessing to the church in Corinth. So these are all the initial things which took place, uh, you know, in Ephesus under the leadership of Aquila and his wife Priscilla. Um, and then in uh, the third missionary journey is when, you know, Paul is able to give more time to this church. So he comes here and um, he stays for three years, you know, during this uh, third missionary journey. And uh, so it, we learn from Acts chapter 19 that for three months, he actually goes into the synagogue, um, the Jewish synagogue, and he shares with them about Jesus Christ. Uh, but then the you know, reception is rather hostile. The people are very angry and upset. And so then he moves out from there, or probably he's been you know, kicked out from there. So he moves into this uh, place called the Hall of Tyrannus, the School of Tyrannus. And he begins to do ministry from there. Uh, he, in fact, uh, teaches from there uh, for up to two years. So um, while he is busy doing his teaching within the city, uh, he's also equipping people and sending them out. And so you have people going all over Asia Minor 
and the gospel is you know uh, spread throughout and uh, so the seven churches you know which we see in revelations chapter 2 and 3 um it this um yeah i mean these people the, the efficient church might have had a role in establishing all of these uh, churches you know they probably would have sent some people from their side as well in establishing uh, these churches um oh, what else um, do we have in your notes we learn that when Paul first begins his work over here, he meets a few believers. Um, no, he meets a few disciples of John the Baptist who have been very sincere to the teachings of John the Baptist, uh, but they don't yet know uh, about Jesus Christ. Uh, they only know that John the Baptist said that the Messiah will come. And so Paul introduces them to the Lord Jesus and they get baptized in water. And even as they're coming out of the waters, uh, you know, they're baptized in the Holy Spirit and they begin to speak in tongues and they prophesy. Uh, we have all kinds of unusual miracles that take place here in Ephesus, um, you know, where you have even uh, uh, pieces of cloth uh, over which Paul has prayed or, or whatever, you know, I mean, even those have the power to heal. So you have all these unusual miracles taking place. Uh, you have one uh, passage where it talks about how um, you know, people who had been involved in witchcraft and sorcery, uh, which would have been at quite a high in the city of Ephesus, because, you know, that was this uh, kind of spiritual center. So a lot of, um, you know, um, uh, spirit controlled activity would have been going on. Uh, and uh, so uh, all of those people, they repent of their, uh, you know, uh, of, of their association with Satan. They come over to the side of the Lord Jesus, uh, you know, through the ministry of this Ephesian church. And uh, so in, in Acts chapter 19, verse 19, we are told that all these uh, former, you know, sorcerers, they come together and they burn all the scrolls, you know, of all the sacred chants and all the sacred rituals which they had been, uh, you know, holding on to. They burn all those things. Those are not exactly just, you know, scraps of uh, papyri. Those are highly valuable documents. They probably would have, you know, inherited it from their ancestors, or they would have purchased it at at, at much, uh, you know, with uh, with much money. Uh, because we we get to know that uh, the total value of those documents uh, turns out to be fifty thousand drachmas. So one drachma would be one day's wages. So if a person were to work all the way from morning up to evening he would earn one drachma. And these documents together, they actually, uh, their value comes up to 50,000 drachmas. So which means some of these sorcerers, you know, who owned those documents must have been pretty rich. You know, they had a good business flourishing through their sorcery and witchcraft. And now they give up all of that and they don't want it to spread further. So they, you know, they had sold that, they would have made money out of it, but they don't sell it. The idea is to extinguish, to destroy it. And so they destroy all of these uh, scrolls and um, uh, uh, you know uh, documents. And um, uh, so uh, we see that uh, the ministry uh, of the kingdom of God is being done in a very powerful way here in this um, Ephesian city. And Ephesus is also the place where a lot of young uh, leaders get trained up. Um, they all have all kinds of names. I mean, it's there in your notes. You have Sopater of Beria, Aristarchus, and Secundus of this, um, of the Thessalonians. All these people, you know, who go out to other places, they've actually got their training over here, here in Ephesus. So this is like one major uh, missions center, you know. So, I mean, um, you know, this should kind of give you an idea that you're not talking about just some little local church. This is like one solid established mission center so you know people of, uh, who are getting trained over here they go from here to to Thessalonia they go to Berea they go to Lystra uh, and they go to Corinth and they uh, you have Erastus who goes to Corinth you have a whole bunch of leaders being developed and um, um, then uh, we also have the church in Ephesus influencing other churches uh, so uh, you know, Paul comes in contact with Philemon and Epaphras of Colossae. Uh, so the church in Colossae was started by Epaphras, and then uh, Paul meets with him, and you know he he probably ministers to him, and um, 
so you okay and so uh, uh, while staying in Ephesus Paul writes two letters the Galatian letter he writes and also the first Corinthians the letter to the uh, to the Corinthian church the first letter are written at Ephesus um, Paul also comes in touch with the ministers the elders in uh, Miletus another place and there too you know his influence spreads he kind of uh, you know has counsels them and guides them as well because it says in Acts 20 that he gave a very powerful message to the elders of the church um, so we have all of that now coming to the letter to the Ephesians when does he write it uh, we get to know that uh, Paul goes to Rome uh, after his third missionary journey he goes to Rome and when he goes over there he along with him you have Luke and Aristarchus and Timothy also going along with him to Rome and that is where his first imprisonment in Rome takes place and so during that imprisonment the first imprisonment in Rome that is when he writes uh, this letter to the Ephesians he also writes uh, the letters to the Colossians Philemon Philippians and so these are all called the prison epistles of Paul that is when he writes it so um, um, so this would have been about three years after he has finished his work in uh, in Ephesus that is when he ends up in prison for the first time in Rome and that is when he writes the letter to this to this Ephesian church um, now after the first imprisonment he comes back uh, and he brings Timothy with him and that is when Timothy becomes the pastor of Ephesus a young man placed over one of the most powerful mission centers so probably he was heavily anointed by the Holy Spirit you know called to this particular task a huge responsibility for a young man to take up but you know this is where I mean um, uh, the Holy Spirit places him so Timothy becomes the main leader and uh, so Paul sets up Timothy over there in Ephesus and then he himself he goes on to Macedonia and then from Macedonia he writes two letters to Timothy Timothy was probably having a tough time a young leader not being taken very seriously by all these established leaders who are already there in Ephesus uh, so um, Timothy must have had quite a tough time in ministry you know in the beginning stages you know until uh, people accepted him and he became established um, so uh, during that time um, you know Paul writes two letters to him so that he can hold on to the ministry work that God has given him and so that he can succeed at it uh, so um, you know as we all know the second letter is written when you know um, by that time he's again, he's again got you know imprisoned and uh, so uh, just a, few, a little while after he finishes writing his second letter to Timothy you know he is uh, martyred so so we 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 learn uh, a little detail about what was going on in the Ephesian church even from the uh, letters to Timothy and uh, also we we get to know that uh, the from Revelation chapter 2 that Ephesus was one of the seven churches that the Lord you know has represented in his presence there are seven lamps in his presence uh, which represent each of those churches and uh, uh, so he's you know those churches are constantly in front of his eyes you know through the symbol of those seven lamps uh, so that was a rather detailed background uh, but then you know it's good for us to have a feel of what this um, you know this letter is all about he, the letter is being written to a to a church that's uh, very very influential that has produced great leaders highly anointed leaders um, it is filled with people who belong to a very um, very very metropolitan culture you know where they've been exposed to all kinds of influences and so there's a chance that they can be very worldly they can be rich they can be proud among them there are also people who are very very poor because those are the kind of you know you have you, you always have this divide you have the very rich and the very poor in in you know in places like this so that is the kind of um, uh, congregation to which he is now writing this letter he's already ministered with them been there for three years done all of that and now 
uh, you know, um, during his uh, first imprisonment in Rome. That is when he writes this letter. And uh, so let's, you know, begin. Uh, we'll, uh, if someone could read out Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I'm writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. Yes. Uh, so Paul introduces, I mean, or rather begins his letter with the words, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So it was God's will that he should uh, become an apostle. It was God's will that he should go out and, you know, uh, help establish churches. Uh, and so, in fact, when he's writing to the first Cor uh, to, to, to the Corinthian believers in First Corinthians 16, 8 and 9, he talks a little bit about his ministry in Ephesus. He kind of just you know, briefly refers to it. And he says that uh, even though he's got this great opportunity to do ministry in Ephesus, there's been a lot of opposition. So. Uh, a great work of God took place in Ephesus, but it was not an easy thing. There's a lot of struggle that went on in the background. And, uh, you know, Paul is able to hold on in spite of all of the opposition and persecution that he faces because he knows that he is in God's will. He's at the center of God's will. So, you know, uh, I mean, um, these courses that we are, you know, conducting, we have people from all walks of life attending. Uh, we have uh, people who are, you know, in, in the secular stream and you know, just to build themselves up, up in the Lord, they are joining our courses. But then we also have some people who are, you know, in full time ministry. So if you are in full time ministry and you are going through a tough time and maybe you are like, you know, Timothy and people are not taking you very seriously. Uh, and uh, or maybe you are like Paul, who's you know suffering a lot of opposition and persecution, even as he is doing a successful ministry. So, whatever your position may be, you know, right now, know this: that if God has called you and it is His will for you to be there, He will cause you to succeed. You will flourish in the ministry that has been given to you. Um, there would be hardships. Uh, there would even be persecution, but uh, you can hold on, you know, in solid faith, knowing that you are an, uh, that you are an apostle or a teacher or a, uh, I mean, or a prophet or whatever it is, whatever full time ministry that you, he has called you to. You can just be sure and confident that because it is by the will of God, you will succeed at it. Okay, so um, I mean, even if you were to take an Old Testament example, Moses. I mean, uh, how did he begin his ministry? I mean, things you know didn't go too well for him. Uh, God appears to him in a in a burning bush and says to him, you know, go and uh, save the people. Moses goes. Moses faithfully speaks to Pharaoh. And what's the next thing that happens? Uh, you know, Pharaoh increases the workload of the people. They were suffering. They were crying out to God, and this great leader Moses intercedes for them, and things get worse. So the first step in Moses' ministry was looked like a huge failure. The minute he started his ministry, the condition of the people got worse. And then, and then you know, in fact, in um, Exodus five twenty two, Moses, you know, he comes back to the Lord and he says, "Is this why you sent me? I mean, just to make the people suffer more? Is this why you called me into ministry? You know, is what he says." So. Uh, you know, we may have our drawbacks, you know, uh, when we are in uh, full time ministry. But if we know that it was the will of God for us to be in this place, to be doing what we are doing, then we can be confident that God will, uh, you know, um, cause us to succeed and God will, you know, take care of every detail for us. So this man, Paul, uh, who is uh, an apostle by the will of God, uh, you know, he goes on to say, grace and peace to you from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and then he says, he says in verse three, he makes an important point in verse three. If someone could read out Ephesians one, verse three, please.
Hey, I really hope someone is listening to this class. Can I read past you? Yeah. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Yes. Uh, so we have been blessed uh, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. Um, now, why is it that uh, you know um, many Christians are living in spiritual poverty? Uh, it is just because they have not quite understood how to access these riches. So here it says that we have already been blessed in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. It's like as if there's this huge treasure trove, you know, this huge bank, bank account of Jesus Christ, which is filled with all the spiritual blessings. And we've been given checks. So we, if we were to submit those checks, we can, you know, uh, withdraw what is required for us, for our needs. Um, uh, so what are the checks that we have? Uh, they are the scriptures, because Jesus Christ is the word of God, right? So you go to him and say, Lord, this is what you are saying in your word. And so, oh Lord, uh, even as uh, I have this need or my church has this need, you know, you go to him and you present your request. And uh, so by faith, uh, you are able to withdraw from the, heavenly account. Um, so a lot of people just do their Bible reading as a Bible reading exercise. You know, uh, on the other hand, if they were to just, um, you know, really meditate on these scriptures, then God would speak specific words to them for their life situations, for their ministry, for their church. Uh, you know, and then those are not just logos. That's the Rama word, right? A Rama word. Logos is, of course, the entire Bible, but um, uh, Rama verses are basically those words which are directly spoken to you by the Holy Spirit for your specific situation, for that particular trial or that season of time, and so those become your checks. You hold on to those, and you say. God specifically spoke this for me, and so he will fulfill it. And so you stand in faith, and you stand in faith till you, you know, it becomes yours. You claim it. And uh, so that's basically how we can, in fact, access all of the spiritual blessings which have been, you know, given to us in Christ Jesus, you know, in the heavenly realm. Uh, so um, whether, you know, it is a, a spiritual struggle that we are going through, uh, you know whether it is uh, uh, a crisis that we are facing as a family uh, whatever it is uh, once we make a practice of regularly spending time in god's presence and meditating on his scriptures those rema words that are specifically spoken to our hearts they have so much power we can claim them we can say god said this to me so god will fulfill it in his perfect time and so we stand in faith and once we stand in faith, what we have, you know, uh, believed in through Jesus, that will be done for us by Jesus. You know, so uh, this is the beauty of um, of what has been offered to us. So uh, most people um, kind of fail to do this. Uh, you know, so the Rama word is something that we can depend upon. So for that, we would have to spend time in God's presence and hear from Him for ourselves directly. All right, so that would make a huge difference. All right, um, let's move into verses 4 and 5. If someone could read out Ephesians 1, 4 and 5, please. And it reads, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Do you want me to continue? Ma? Uh, yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, it says over here, he chose us in him before the creation of the world. So even before the world was created, you know, um, we have this other scripture, right, where it talks about how the Lamb of God was slain from the foundation of the world. So even before the world was created, God already knew all that would take place. 
He knew that uh, the humans that he has created would fall into sin. He knew that a redemption plan would have to be set. And so he already set it in place for humans. Uh, so all of this was already done. So in the same way, before the creation of the world, he also knew who would respond to this redemption plan and you know come under the covering of Jesus Christ. So he already knew that. And so it says over here, he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless. And then in verse 5, it says, he predestined us for adoption. Now, um, you know, a lot of controversy, right, uh, is there surrounding these verses. Um, uh, people talk about predestination. So uh, the main two schools of thought are the Calvinists and the, uh, you know, uh, Arminians. Uh, so the Calvinist school will say salvation is for everyone. Uh, when, when God sent Jesus Christ into the world, he was sending Jesus Christ for the whole world, not just for some appointed people who will be just uh, the only chosen ones. On the other hand, uh, the people who belong to the you know school of Arminism, they would say, no, no, no. God has predestined certain people for salvation. Only they will get saved. Everyone else has been predestined for hell, is what you know they would say. Um, so, uh, be, you, you based on this, you know, word predestined, which is used in Ephesians one five, uh, you have a lot of um, uh, wrong doctrine coming out of that. Um, now, we have many good believers who believe in this. There are some who will say no salvation is for everyone, but you know uh, there are believers who also say no, no, no salvation is reserved for a few. Uh, for me, that was a bit of a shock to discover that uh, because I've always um, been in churches uh, where it was very clearly believed that salvation is for everyone, and so when I was suddenly exposed to a uh, you know a, a, to a Bible college where it was being taught. Uh, that salvation is only for a few. And I had to teach over there and take a stand and say, uh, no, 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 salvation is not reserved for a few. And then I had a whole bunch of people debating with me and bringing up scriptures and giving their interpretation of it. It was all a bit of a shock. And I was thinking, uh, these are good people. These are people who are ministering. But what are they ministering? With what idea are they ministering? They're actually ministering thinking that maybe some of the people that they're ministering to are not even destined for heaven. I mean, I don't know. It, it was all a very new, shocking experience for me. Um, I tried from, I mean, from my side, whatever I could explain, I did. I'm not sure how many were convinced, but it was my strong prayer. I was praying very much and saying, Lord, you please help them to see that salvation is for everyone, not just for a few. So, I mean, I, I, mean, I am very aware that there are believers who even believe in this other belief that uh, salvation is reserved for a few. So I thought maybe we could just you know, look at a few scriptures um, just so that we would have some clarity regarding this issue. Because just in case someone suddenly comes to you and you know uh, says this, at least you, know, you should know what the scriptures have to say on the subject. All right. So um, before we actually get into that, just one simple example from the Old Testament. See, when Jesus Christ, well, okay, when when um, not Jesus Christ specifically at that time, uh, you know, it was just the Godhead, Yahweh, the Godhead. Uh, he says to the um, people of Israel, he says, "I will choose you as my chosen ones." Okay, so he says, you know, build a tabernacle to me, and when, once you build the tabernacle, I will literally come and dwell among you, and you, I'll be your God, and you will be my people. Now, now, whom did he choose as his people? It was the entire nation of Israel, right? It's not like he said, OK, these three tribes I'm going to choose for myself. The other tribes can watch out for themselves. He doesn't say that, right? When he says, I will be your God and you will be my people, he's talking about the entire nation of Israel, all the 12 tribes, all of them become his people. But, you know, um, we know we know their history. You know how they fall away. Uh, you know uh, from the faith. 
they don't follow Yahweh, they don't obey him, and they go through that entire process. Finally, in the prophetic books, you have God saying, there'll be but there'll be one, one remnant who will stay faithful to me, and I will restore them, I'll bring them back to the land. And, you know, God says all of that, and he even talks about the end times. He talks about the end times when Zion will be established, and only the True people, the true followers of Yahweh are the only ones who will enter at that time into Zion. So all of these things, you know, God begins to say. And if we if we can just maybe look at Galatians chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. If someone could please read out Galatians 6, 15 and 16, please. It doesn't matter whether we have been circumcised or not. What count is whether we have been transformed into a new creation? Mm -hmm. May God's peace and mercy be upon all who live by this principle. They are the new people of God. Okay, so um, I'm not sure what translation she's using. Uh, it kind of makes every sentence very simple. Uh, but yeah, I mean, um, sometimes it doesn't catch the original phrase. So over here, I know if you were looking in your uh, NKJV or if you were looking in your um, uh, NIV, the verse 16, it will say, you know, uh, peace and mercy to whom? To the Israel of God, uh, not to the people of God. So over here, it's not all of Israel which is being referred to as his chosen ones. The peace and mercy is being, ex is, is being extended to only some specific people who the people, you know, we, we looked at this in Galatians. The people who are no longer trusting in circumcision, but they have chosen to place their trust in Jesus Christ. So they alone in the end become the chosen ones. Okay, so at a general level, God chose all of the nation to be his people. But depending on their response, depending on whether they wanted to believe in him or not, finally only one portion ended up as the chosen ones. They became the Israel of God. They became the people of God because they chose to respond to what he is offering. So in the very same way, Jesus Christ, when he was sent, he was sent to save the whole world. You know, so let's just look at a couple of scriptures and then we'll, you know, we'll move on to the next thing. Um, if someone could read out 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 4 to 6, please. 1 Timothy 2, 4 to 6. 1 Timothy 2, 4 to 6. Uh, you want me to read four to six or three to six? Oh, uh, I have it down over here in my notes as First Timothy two four to six. So okay, yeah, no problem. Oh. Yeah, no problem, Pastor. Okay, it says, um, I just wanted to give context. That's why. Right. Okay, it says that uh, who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge to the knowledge of the truth, for there is one God, one mediator between God and mankind. And the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people, this has now been witnessed to at a, the proper time. Uh, yeah, um, I was a little bit distracted because you know Kung has put up a question there, uh, but right now I'm, I'm in I'm in I'm in the middle of this. But Kung, I'll most definitely answer your question uh, maybe a little later. You know, let's just kind of get through this first um because we're kind of in the middle of this argument uh okay so um so in first timothy chapter 2 verses 4 to 6 it says that god wants all people to be saved he wants all people to come to a knowledge of the truth okay so and then in verse 6 it says who gave himself as a ransom for all people amen see if you have made up your mind that you're going to save only some people then you're not even going to give yourself as a ransom for all people. You'll only give yourself as a ransom for those specific chosen few, few whom you have predestined. But that is not at all what comes through over here, you know, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Here it so clearly indicates that this salvation is for all people. And for that purpose, Jesus Christ came down to give himself ra as a ransom, not just for a chosen few, but as a ransom for all people. So everyone is getting covered. And... Uh, um, but when you come to John 3, 16, you know, the, the really, really famous verse, which we all know by heart, uh, if, you know, if someone could actually read out those words, John 3, 16, if someone could read out for us, please. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, 
and that whosoever believes in him will not perish but would have eternal life it says here that god so loved the world it doesn't say that he has now decided to show his love to only some portions of the world here it's talking about the entire world god so loved the world the entire world that he gave his one and only son but who becomes the chosen ones it will be only those who choose to believe in him because they are the ones who will not perish but have eternal life the rest of them even though he has loved them even though he has sent his son for them as well they will not um, you know be saved because they have chosen not to believe him so uh, so what god has done is done for everyone but depending on the response of these people to whom he's making a free offer if they say yes we want this free offer then immediately he accepts them on the other hand they say no we don't want the free offer uh, then you know they lose out on what god has to offer so you know kind of keeping all of this in our minds uh, let's just look at romans chapter 8 29 and 30 because here again you have that word predestined um, and uh, let us look at the way this entire uh, you know idea is presented over here romans 8 29 and 30 please romans 8 29 and 30 for those god for new he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters and those he predestined he also called and those he called he also justified and those he justified he also glorified amen and so you have people saying see see look at these verses here it says that certain people alone have been predestined before the creation of the world they were predestined to be called to be justified to be glorified as for the rest of them they were predestined for hell you know so is what they would say but look at the i mean i i i looked up in bible hub just to be sure to see whether that is the way the sentence construction is in the greek So you can just go to Bible Hub. It's free of cost. You know, just look up uh, your uh, Romans eight twenty nine and thirty in the Greek, and look at the ordering of the words. Okay, which which word comes first? Which word comes second? So we see over here those God foreknew. He also predestined. So the ones that he foreknew. he foreknew who would be accepting him he foreknew who would be placing their faith in jesus christ he foreknew that so based on the foreknowledge which he had he chooses to predestine those people so it's not like as if god you know starts off by predestining some people and saying oh only these people i'm going to choose for myself no it the whole process begins with the foreknowledge of god god knew beforehand he foreknew in the same way he knew that there would be a fall that you know adam and eve would sin and so he uh, right at that time itself before the creation of the world he already um, you know uh, set in place the lamb of god who would be who would be the sacrifice so he foreknew the fall of humans in the same way he also foreknew who would be the people who will place their faith in the lamb of god so based on that foreknowledge then you have the word predestined being used so first you have god foreknowing something and then based on that foreknowledge he also predestines those people okay so uh, over here uh, it, it's very clearly brought out that uh, salvation is for everyone it's just that god knew who are the people who would be choosing to place their faith in him and based on that he grants them the privileges which he has promised everyone okay so he has promised it to everyone but whoever wants to take it will receive it uh, so um, we'll just simply you know uh, talk about this and not go into further detail on uh, predestination uh, because it's uh, because the debate on that has been going on for centuries and um, we can't devote our entire time to that you know in in our class right now um well yes um mangi i remember your <laughs> name pronunciation so yes if you can go ahead with your question yeah thank you pastor yeah. um question is on uh, 
uh, Paul's life. Mm. Okay, how we know that God called him to be his minister, but Paul uh, didn't choose to to be a, a, um, an, an apostle. God had to call him by force. So how can we connect uh, the predestination and the calling of Paul? I don't know if you understand my question. Yeah, I'm kind of trying to, you know, uh, catch it. Mm, here we looked at how, um, where is our verse? Romans 8, uh, 30. So those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Uh, brother, you're referring to this particular verse, you know, the calling which is mentioned over here, the, you know, the predestination and the calling mentioned over here in this specific verse. Isn't it? I, yes. Yes. Pastor. Okay. Uh, so now this uh, over here is referring to all the believers who are going to be placing their faith in him. So um, he predestines them to be confirmed to the image of his son. So he, he, know, he foreknows all those who are going to say yes to Jesus Christ. So all of those people, he's predestining them to be confirmed to the image of his son. And then he calls them uh, to whatever purposes he has for their lives. And having called them, you know, they can't exactly go and serve in a sinful state. He justifies them as well. So those he has called, he also justifies. So in the same, the same process would have happened even, you know, for Paul. So Paul also, God knew beforehand that he would say yes. So God had a calling for him. And uh, so God says to him that, you know, you will be an apostle and uh, you, you you will go and you know share about me you'll talk about me with people so we see that in acts um why do you say that it was uh, it was like forced upon him i mean at, uh, i mean why do you say that paul was not keen on the idea no because uh, mm. i say that because uh, if if something is pre uh, this end, uh, this yeah, mm. that means it is designed for for that. So oh, okay. a car is designed to to walk on the road, and that you cannot. Yeah. So if God designed you to to be a preacher, your you, all your life you should be a preacher. So Paul was on his way to the Damascus, and mm. God, mm. Jesus met him and said, "No." Don't do that, but instead you should go and preach to the Gentiles mm. uh, for, mm. for my sake. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so over here, there is no compulsion. As in, uh, when you say predestined, it's not like as if the person is forced and has no choice, no free will. Um, free will is always there. So God has told, you know, Paul that now you know now you know that i am real that i have indeed been resurrected from the dead and uh, so now you know that i am divine i am god and savior so you know choose to accept me and this is the mission i have for your life now paul if he had wished to he could have said no i don't want to do it and he could have walked away so god does not control people so even today i mean all of us we can always say no and we can say, no, I don't want to be uh, doing this. I'd rather go to something else. So predestination uh, does not mean that he forces people to you know, stay. Um, predestination doesn't mean that you literally get programmed in such a way that you have no choice. You have to do that and you, have, um, you, know, you cannot walk away from it. You can walk away from it. It's just that you would be walking away from all the beautiful plans that he has for you. So you you choose, you know, in your wisdom, you choose to stay within his calling. But it is not an uh, it is not a forceful act that you cannot resist. If you choose to resist his calling, you can. You have full freedom to resist it. We choose not to because we know that he's a good God and he has good plans for us. Um, so um, a a car is predestined to be a car on the road it cannot 
turn into a washing machine and it has no choice it's been programmed and predestined to be like that uh, but uh, humans are not like that uh, in the sense i can be an apostle if i'm called to be an apostle on the other hand if i say no i'd rather want i want to go and be a trader and make money i mean god would say you know fine of course god would not just leave it like that he loves his people so much so you know he would send the holy spirit again and again you know to convict me to to convince me he would he would send godly people to come and counsel me oh he would do everything he he would turn uh, i know the the heaven and earth over just to you know get through to me so he would not just give up but at the end of it all if i'm still stubborn and say no i want to go and be a trader and make money god will say fine you know it is your choice so i am not predestined and controlled and literally forced into becoming an apostle whether i want it or not uh, so that word predestined is not that it's just that he's giving them a privilege he's saying you know i am predestining you to be this would you like to be a part of it and most people will jump up and say oh yes you know so if, if if there is at all anyone who says no and holds on to his no in spite of all the convincing of the lord and that is that person's free choice we'll take our break because people you know need their break and then if you need further clarification we'll come back after the break and deal with that so uh, 10 uh, if all of us could log back in once again please thank you